Genesis chapter 23 and reading from verse 1. This is God's word. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. She died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I am an alien and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here so that I can bury my dead. The Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. Then Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites. He said to them, If you are willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf, so that he will sell me the cave of Machpelah which belongs to him and is at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. Ephron the Hittite was sitting among his people and he replied to Abraham in the hearing of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of his city. No, my Lord, he said, listen to me. I give you the field and I give you the cave that is in it. I give it to you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. Again, Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in their hearing, Listen to me, if you will, I will pay the price of the field. Accept it from me so that I can bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, Listen to me, my lord, the land is worth 400 shekels of silver, but what is that between me and you? Bury your dead. Abraham agreed to Ephron's terms and weighed out for him the price he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weight current among the merchants. So Ephron's field in Machpelah near Mamre, both the field and the cave in it and all the trees within the borders of the field was legally made over to Abraham as his property in the presence of all the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. Afterwards, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is at Hebron in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave in it were legally made over to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. We're thankful to God that this is his word for us today. I'm going to sing again, uh, Alas, and did my saviour uh, die, Isaac Watts' hymn, uh, reflecting on the wonder of the fact that Christ died for us. Genesis and um, chapter uh, 23 is uh, an important chapter. It has a number of uh, firsts uh, in this chapter. It's the uh, first and only reference to a woman's age in the Bible. Um, it's the first death of someone in Abraham's family. It's the first reference to mourning for the dead. It's the first reference to a burial. It's the first piece of Canaan, the only piece of Canaan that is owned by Abraham. So we have this cluster of firsts in this chapter, but what is the chapter about? Uh, different Bible headings uh, give different suggestions. Uh, many uh, speak of uh, the heading as the death of Sarah. Well, that takes up one verse in this chapter. Uh, other Bibles give the heading the burial of Sarah. Well, that also takes up just one verse in the chapter. One Bible version combines the two, the death and burial of Sarah. Well, that's still only two verses. Interestingly, I think the Good News Bible gets the closest. Sarah dies and Abraham buys a burial ground. Well, let's look at the chapter and uh, uh, think about some of the things it lays before us before we come to, I think, what it, its main lesson. It does put death before us. And it's a reminder uh, that death 
comes to us all even after a long life. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. These were the years of, that she lived, uh, it tells us. Death is a reality and a certainty. One of the old Puritans says this, there is none so old but thinks he may live one year longer. And though in the general he says all must die, yet in the false numbering of his own particular day, he thinks to live forever. No, death is a reality. Death is a certainty. And uh, uh, we're obviously being faced with that afresh in our nation, uh, which I think is probably a healthy thing to be faced with the reality, the certainty of death. Our society normally seeks to avoid death, talk of death, thinking about death at all costs. Uh, William Cowper, the poet uh, from Northamptonshire uh, for about five or six years, uh, uh, added a poem to the end of the Bill of Mortality for Northamptonshire. So uh, the Bill of Mortality was a description of how many people died and what they died of. Uh, and each year, he, uh, for a number of years, he added a, a poem uh, to that. And I just want to read extracts from one of those poems. He says in his poem, While thirteen moons saw smoothly run the Nen's barge-laden wave, and it is the Nen, by the way, he, he spells it N-E-N, -E it's not the Nen, it's the Nen. So while thirteen moons saw smoothly run the Nen's barge-laden wave, all these, life's rambling journey done, have found their home, the grave. Like crowded forest trees we stand, and some are marked to fall. The axe will smite at God's command, and soon shall smite us all. No present health can health ensure for yet an hour to come. No medicine, though it oft can cure, can always balk the tomb. And though that humble as my lot and scorned as is my strain, these truths, though known, too much forgot, I may not teach in vain. The reality of death, the certainty of death, is something that we must face. And also that we must make sure that our children uh, face uh, and our grandchildren uh, too. They should not be shielded from death. I always think it's a little peculiar when uh, children uh, are not taken to funerals. Uh, but no, I think children need to be faced with the reality of death. It's interesting in, in the Gospels, uh, we have that reference to uh, a game that children obviously played in gospel times. Uh, they didn't play doctors and nurses, they played weddings and funerals. Remember Jesus speaks, uh, lightening his uh, generation to children in the marketplace, who said, we played the flute for you and you did not dance, we sang a dirge and you did not cry. Children knew about death, they actually played weddings and funerals. Well, I think that's a healthy thing, that we have to be faced with the reality of death. And this is what this chapter is doing, isn't it? Certainly, setting before us the reality of death. No matter how long you might live, death does come. Death will come. In his uh, book, Setting Our Sights on Heaven, uh, uh, Paul Wolfe, he, he says in one of his chapters about preparing our loved ones for death. He says, we can ill afford to be squeamish about these subjects. Get over the discomfort you may feel when it comes to talking about dying and destiny. That does not mean talk about these things constantly and with everyone. It does mean talk about them naturally and at least occasionally. He says, as a father, I have made it my goal to set heaven before my children in such a way that should God take me there today, my wife would be able to say to them, do you remember how daddy used to talk about heaven, about how wonderful it will be, about how, how excited he was going uh, about going there? Well, he's there right now. Yes, we miss him and we should cry, 
but we also love him and so we will be happy for him and as we trust in jesus we can be sure that we'll be with daddy again best of all we can be sure that we'll be with jesus too he says and i want my children to be able to answer yes mummy we remember daddy did talk a lot about heaven didn't he the observation has been made that one of the greatest gifts a parent can give his children is the well-founded confidence that he is bound for heaven when death comes. Parents, have you given that gift? Grandparents, think of all the gifts you have given to your children, all the toys you assembled, all the packages you wrapped, all the vacations you provided. Did you give them all those things without ever giving them peace of mind about your standing with God and thus your eternal destiny? Have you spoken about your faith in Christ and your heavenly hope in such a way as to put to rest any fears they may feel the bible confronts us with the uh, reality and the certainty of death uh, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, should do the same uh, with uh, our loved ones uh, with one another uh, as god's believing people and associated with death notice here in genesis 23 is grief there it is in verse 2, uh, Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, Hebron in the land of Canaan, and Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. And uh, that was true also in the New Testament when uh, Stephen is stoned uh, and dies. We read in Acts chapter 8 verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Grief and sorrow is right uh, because death uh, brings sorrow and separation and parting. Uh, Matthew Henry says, Abraham did sincerely lament the great loss he had of a good wife and gave proof of the constancy of his affection to her to the last. He says it is not only lawful, but it is a duty to lament the death of our near relations. Yes, we're not to grieve as those who have no hope, but we are to grieve uh, because death is a foreign invader in God's creation. It's always abnormal. It brings sorrow. Uh, uh, it, uh, it brings grief. So the reality of death uh, and the grief that it causes at those who are left. That's one thing that the chapter certainly sets before us. Another thing the chapter uh, deals with is burial. Um, and I think we're not to be, uh, uh, we're not to think that Abraham is caught unawares uh, when Sarah dies and is sort of flapping around trying to find a, a, a place to bury her. Uh, I think Abraham already had a burial place in mind. He knew exactly who owned the cave uh, that he was going to uh, uh, purchase. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, Abraham is, uh, already had in mind what he would do when his wife died. And I think we, it's clear from the Bible that burial is the norm uh, when it comes to death, although burning, uh, cremation, uh, does also occur. It occurs as a punishment. You remember Achan in Joshua 7, he was stoned to death and then uh, burned. But it also occurs as an honour. Uh, Saul and his sons, uh, when the Philistines had killed them uh, and uh, decapitated them, uh, men from Jabesh Gilead went to, and recovered their bodies, burned them, and then buried the bones uh, that was a, a, an act of honour done to Saul and his sons. So it's interesting that uh, uh, John Piper and, and John MacArthur come to different conclusions about burial and cremation. Uh, John Piper uh, uh, urges that burial should be uh, the norm. Uh, John MacArthur thinks it's, uh, it's an indifferent matter. Um, uh, all that cremation does is accelerate uh, dissolution and uh, corruption. But I think burial is, uh, should be the norm, uh, particularly because I, it's related to uh, laying someone to rest. 
And you know that the Bible so often speaks about those who die as having fallen asleep. And uh, uh, that's because, uh, uh, yes, certainly uh, uh, a dead person looks like a sleeping person. But uh, uh, we, we lay them to rest. Uh, we uh, bury them. Uh, John uh, Piper speaks about that the burial best fits the analogy in 1 Corinthians 15 about sowing. You sow a seed. But of course, uh, Abraham doesn't bury Sarah in the ground. He buries her in a cave. It's not so much about sowing. I think it's about sleeping. Uh, you lay someone to rest. You know that our word cemetery is from the Greek uh, language, meaning a dormitory. Uh, a cemetery is a sleeping place. And I think the uh, IVP Bible Dictionary uh, brings out very helpfully what that means. It, it, the use of uh, death as sleeping, this signifies that death, like sleep, is neither a permanent state, nor does it destroy the identity of the sleeper. That's, I think, why uh, the Bible uses uh, the terminology of people falling asleep uh, when it speaks of death. It's a reminder that death is neither a permanent state, nor does it destroy the identity of the sleeper. And so I think that's part of the reason that we, we bury someone. We are laying them to rest, uh, to, to sleep until that great awakening day uh, 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 at the resurrection. Uh, when bodies are restored, uh, uh, reunited with their souls uh, in uh, uh, the eternity of an embodied existence for uh, both the righteous and the wicked. And so uh, and we need to uh, just encourage you to prepare for your death and burial. Have you made your arrangements uh, in that regard? That will help your family. Uh, when uh, such a time comes uh, that you've made preparation uh, for uh, your death. And so death uh, is uh, here evidently in this chapter. Uh, burial is an important part of uh, what the chapter is about and uh, Abraham providing for the burial of Sarah and this uh, burial plot will be used for uh, uh, the other patriarchs as we'll see in a moment. But the bulk of the chapter is actually about this business deal. Perhaps that's what the chapter is about, business deals uh, and uh, how we go about them. It's a very detailed description of this negotiation that uh, Abraham enters into with uh, the Hittites. And there are some important factors in this uh, deal. Uh, notice how polite Abraham is in the deal. Uh, verse 7 tells us that he bows down before the people of the land. Uh, and again in verse 12, he bows down before the people of the land. Uh, Abraham shows proper respect uh, to those that he's dealing with. Uh, he's polite and good-mannered. That's a, that's a good thing in our dealings. This is a very public deal. Uh, uh, three times uh, we're told that it's in the hearing of uh, the Hittites. Twice we're told it's in the presence of the Hittites. Twice we're told it happens at the gate of the city where business was transacted. This is a very public deal uh, that Abraham enters into. So it's, uh, 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 Abraham is polite in his dealings. He's very public in this uh, negotiation. And then notice he also uh, pays the full price in the proper currency. At the end of verse 9, he says, ask uh, Ephron to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. Uh, and at the end of verse 16, uh, 400 shekels of silver according to the weight current among the merchants. Abraham paid the full price in the proper currency uh, in this deal. So at no point does Abraham try to get one over the person he's dealing with. Everything is above board and honest and unselfish. Well, that's a brilliant model, isn't it, for our dealings, whether it's business dealings, in our commercial dealings, in our dealings with uh, those around us. Uh, we too must make sure that everything is above board and honest 
and unselfish. That's a very important witness. Because at the beginning of the passage in verse 6, when the Hittites speak to Abraham, they say, Sir, listen to us, you are a mighty prince among us. Uh, the ESV gives that more literally. You are a prince of God among us. You are a prince of God. They knew that Abraham had an association with God. And so it's so important that his dealings reflected that. Uh, that he brought no disgrace on God's name in the way that he dealt uh, with these Hittites in the matter of purchasing this uh, land. It was an important witness to him as a believer that he dealt in this way. And I think that's, uh, there's great stress laid on that. That's the, the bulk of the chapter it is uh, related to that. And so that's an important truth as well that we must bear in mind. So we have death we have burial, we have dealing. But I think the, the key part of this chapter is actually, actually about faith. Why purchase a burial plot in a land where on your own confession in verse 4, Abraham says, I am an alien and a stranger. Why would you purchase a, 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 a burial plot in a land where you are an alien and a stranger? Because Abraham knows that actually this land where he is an alien and a stranger will be the possession of his descendants. This is the first installment of full possession. I want a burial place here because according to God's promise, this will be our land. Yes, at the moment it's the, he's buying it from the people of the land, as that's a couple of times in this passage. The Hittites are the people of the land, but Abraham knows that by faith this land will be the possession of his descendants according to God's promise. I think that parallels with Isaac. <clears throat> he has one son and one son only, and yet God has promised him a, a great nation. Uh, and many descendants. Uh, and, and just as he has one son, and by faith he believes that God will make him a great nation. So he has one field, and yet he knows that by faith this whole land will be his possession. And I think what is being stressed as well here is that this portion of the land is his rightful possession. That's why we have such a detail about this negotiation. It's making the point that uh, Abraham gets this rightfully. It's his rightful possession. He hasn't stolen it. He hasn't used uh, uh, underhand means to get it. It is his rightful possession. And so notice verse 17 uh, in conclusion. It says, so Ephron's field in Machpelah near Mamre, both the field and the cave in it, and all the trees within the borders of the field was legally made over to Abraham as his property. In the presence of the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city afterwards, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which is at Hebron in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave in it were legally made over to Abraham by the Hittites as a burial site. The chapter ends not with Sarah's burial, but with Abraham's right to the land. And so it's interesting uh, then in subsequent uh, references to this burial plot, how that is underlined uh, next in chapter 25, uh, when it speaks of Abraham's burial. In chapter 25 and verse 9, Abraham has died. It says in 25 and verse 9, his sons Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah near Mamre in the field of Ephron, son of Zohar the Hittite, the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. So again, it's emphasized that this was the field that Abraham brought, uh, bought from the Hittites. It's his by right. Uh, at the end of the book of Genesis in chapter 49, when uh, Jacob uh, is uh, uh, near his death in Genesis 49 and verse 29. 
Uh, Jacob uh, gave his sons these instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field. He didn't have to say all that, but he's making the point that this was Abraham's by right. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave in it were bought from the Hittites, making the point that it was legally theirs. Uh, and again, in chapter 50, uh, at verse 12, here is uh, Joseph. Uh, uh, so Jacob's sons did as he commanded them. They carried him, sorry, to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre, which Abraham had brought as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite along with the field and so it, every time it's mentioned it's mentioned that he bought it. it it was his by right a rightful possession so what's that got to say to us well for the believer the believer has an inheritance promised we have an inheritance promised us and justification gives us a right to it. Justification not only deals with what's wrong uh, by the removal of our sin, it also gives us a right to our inheritance. We have that righteousness that gives us a right uh, to claim the inheritance, not uh, our efforts, not our doing. It's the righteousness of Christ credited to us, uh, made ours when we believe. And that righteousness gives us a right to the inheritance that God has prepared for those who love him. Uh, and uh, uh, by faith, we uh, can uh, claim that uh, inheritance as our right, um, not uh, because of our performance, but because of Christ's righteousness credited to us. And the Holy Spirit is the first installment of that possession that's what the new testament makes clear to us that the holy spirit just as this field was abraham's first installment the holy spirit is the first installment of our inheritance in romans uh, chapter 8 and verse 23 uh, it, um, Paul says in uh, Romans 8, 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Who have the first fruits of the Spirit, the down payment, the first installment. Uh, again in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 5, now it says, it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. And there in 2 Corinthians 5, he's speaking about our inheritance in heaven uh, that is prepared for us uh, after death. Well, the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing what is to come similarly in ephesians 1 and verse 13 paul writes to the ephesians and you also were included in christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation having believed you were marked in him with a seal the promised holy spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are god's possession to the praise of his glory the Holy Spirit in his gifts and graces is the first installment of the glories that uh, await those who believe. Uh, and we have a right to that installment uh, by uh, the justification that's ours in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us with his power, uh, with his uh, uh, gifts and uh, fruit uh, with uh, his uh, gracious influences uh, as a foretaste, as a uh, installment, as the first fruits of what will be ours by right through Christ Jesus. 
Uh, so yeah, this uh, chapter is about death uh, and burial and uh, proper dealings. But I think ultimately it's about faith in God's promise, uh, the, uh, install, the first instalment uh, that guarantees the full inheritance that's ours uh, through faith uh, as Abraham, the believer, uh, begins to possess the land. Yes, we have uh, uh, the, the first instalment, uh, and yet it's only uh, how glorious that is, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how wonderful that is in our experience. And yet it's only uh, a tiny instalment of the glories that are ours uh, uh, by God's blessing uh, and his favour as our inheritance by grace through faith. So we're going to sing uh, as we conclude, in Christ alone my hope is found. It's Christ that guarantees our inheritance, it's uh, through him that it's our right, uh, and so it's in Christ alone our hope is found.